Hello and welcome, Storyline, to part four, our fourth and final part of our series, Rooted and Built Up. And once again, a special uh, welcome and shout out to those of you that are tuning in from either Eugene, Oregon or Atlanta, Georgia. Wherever you're tuning in from, we're happy you're here, but because we have groups that meet in Atlanta and Eugene, we always like to give them a special hello. So great to see you guys. We are in part four of four in our Rooted and Built Up series, and uh, we're going to get into that in just a bit, but let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, please orient yourself to us right now. We know you've already done that. You've done that in Christ. You do it every moment. Father, if you neglected us for even a moment, even a second, we would be in big trouble. We would probably cease to exist on the spot. But Father, we're asking that you will give us your spirit and that you would just be with us, be near us, and give us a strong sense of your love and your care. Father, give us insight into your word. And especially, Father, as we come here to the fourth and final part of our Rooted and Built Up series, I just pray, Father, that clarity would prevail, that charity would prevail, and that we would come away from this presentation and this whole series with a better understanding of who you are, of who we are, and how we can relate positively and lovingly to, toward the world around us. Uh, this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're in, as I've said, part four right here, fruit. Fruit, that's what we're going to be talking about. And once again, we're going to start, as we have in every other case, by taking a look at Psalm 1. That's right, you guessed it. We're going to read the first three verses of Psalm 1, the first of the more than... Well, I guess it's 150 psalms found in the Bible, or at least in the book of Psalms. And uh, we're going to read here, Psalm 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, Blessed is the man, or happy is the man, or woman, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. Now, verse 3, He shall be like a tree. Very good. I know you said it with me. Planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit. Aha! That's what we'll be talking about today. In its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. All right, we've started every session so far, every one of our four parts there. And again, I invite you just to sort of enter into the world of the psalmist, the mind of the psalmist. And I think I might have mentioned in the first or the second uh, uh, part when we were talking about if you've ever seen a photo, an overhead photo, maybe an airplane level or a hot air balloon, or maybe you've come into an airport and you look down and you see this sort of snaky, windy, you know, path of trees, that is where a river or a stream is flowing. And then that's an area where there's going to be a lot of nourishment and a lot of water. And it's a great place to be if you're a tree, right? And I mentioned, I think, that because I'm really into birds and bird watching, uh, we call those areas very often riparian areas. And it's an area that not only do trees like to go, but insects like to go. And if insects like to be there, then you better believe that birds like to be there. So let's just do a little bit of reviewing as we think about this invitation on behalf of or by God, as communicated by the psalmist, to be like a tree planted by waters that bears fruit. But before we get into the fruit part, let's just quickly review everything that we've learned up to this point. Just survey it. So we started at the very bottom. We started with the soil, and we said that our soil is our environment. Our environment broadly consists of two different areas, right? Things that we cannot control and things that we can control. We are all planted in our own situation, our own circumstance, our own family, with our own genetics, and there are things out of our control, things that we cannot change. But there are things that we can change, things like attitude, choices, words, friends, interests, inputs, principles, and ultimately even our character, okay? We're going to be talking about that today. And so then we talked in our second session about roots, right? Moving from the soil up to the roots. And we noted that roots do four things for plants and trees. They absorb, they anchor, they transport, and they store. And we noted that healthy root systems produce healthy trees. Good soil, good roots, good tree, good fruits, which is what we'll be talking about in just a moment. So believers, we noted, are grafted into Jesus. He is our strong and stable 
root. And we will talk a little bit more about that today. Then the last time we were together, we talked about tree. And we just went through, you know, these incredible variety of trees, cedar trees and bristlecone pine and hewn pine. And we just said, look at the diversity, all of the different colors and the shapes and the sizes. And even if you had, look at this beautiful rainbow eucalypt, even if you had two redwood trees or two koa trees or sequoia trees, they wouldn't be identical. In fact, they would be very, very different in many regards. And so we noted that there is no such thing as an average tree or body or brain or person, right? No such thing as an average. And we spent our time in, in closing in our last session talking about these beautiful little works of art, bonsai trees, bonsai trees. And some of these trees are hundreds of years old and worth hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars. And so we said, you are not average, you are unique and wonderful, your worth is immeasurable. And you might remember I created that little word there, I didn't spell it uh, the, my new way here, but wonderful, O-N-E, because you are one of a kind, you are wonderful. And so uh, God loves you infinitely, yes, but also individually. Okay, so now that brings us right up to fruit. Okay, right up to this uh, consideration here, we've gone all the way up from the soil to the roots to the tree, and now ultimately to the fruit. We've started in Psalm 1. Let's now remind ourselves of the parable of Jesus, the parable of the sower that we've looked to in each of our sessions. So Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 to 8, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns. We've not talked a lot about that, but you get the idea, which grew up and choked the plants. And then finally here, still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop. And that's what we're going to be talking about now, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now, remember, Jesus, when he says whoever has ears, he doesn't mean, you know, check on the side of your head to make sure your ears are there. He's saying to hear with understanding. Now, I just want to hone in here on this idea of 100 or 60 or 30. The last time we were together, we talked about how this demonstrates that, that built in to the very idea of the crop that's being described here, or a tree, is that not everybody is the same. There is no average. We're all unique, and we return uh, to God uh, fruitfulness according to the unique personality and situation and circumstance in which we find ourselves. But I, I really like this idea. Just imagine a tomato. Let's start there. So let's say you have a single tomato seed, right? And my wife, actually, I should say, should say just yesterday, or maybe it was the day before, she's finally planted her own little greenhouse. And uh, yesterday she gave me a tour of it and it's just, it's lovely. She's, she's one of those people that has not one green thumb, but two green thumbs. If she touches something, if it's a, a plant or a flower or a vegetable, it just grows. I have the opposite problem. I have, as it were, black thumbs. If you give me a plant or anything like that, I'll have that thing dead in no time. In fact, several times in my life, I've had people say to me, David, not even you could kill this plant. This plant cannot be killed. And sure enough, it just gets around me and I watch over it for a little while. I either underwater it or overwater it or put it in too much sun or not enough sun and voila, I can kill things <laughs> very quickly. But my wife has the opposite, which is great because she's the one that grows the vegetables. But anyway, just imagine you have a single tomato seed and you put that single tomato seed into the ground and then it grows up. And let's say, just for sake of illustration here, there are 20 tomatoes that, that grow. And each of those 20 tomatoes, we'll say, has 10 seeds. Okay, well now you have 200 seeds. So we went from one seed to 200 seeds. Okay, now let's imagine that we planted all 200 of those seeds. Do you see what's happening here? So this idea of producing a crop or bearing fruit is that God wants to see exponential growth. I mean, there's an object lesson right in the fruit itself, right? Because no matter what fruit you're eating, very often, not always, but very often, there will be numerous seeds inside of a given piece of fruit, okay? So let's talk about this idea of bearing fruit or producing a crop. What does it mean to produce a crop or to be fruitful? 
Well, let's start here in the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus. So this is still Jesus in Matthew. And Jesus says, and this is actually quite humorous what he says. It might not sound terrifically funny to us or super humorous to us, but in the culture and context in which Jesus said this, I can imagine there when he was delivering his sermon on the Sermon on the Mount that people had a little chuckle or a little smile or perhaps even an outright laugh when Jesus said this. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And then this is the funny part. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? The answer, by the way, is no. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears what? Bad fruit. And so Jesus here is, is speaking with, you know, he's speaking exaggeratively. He's saying, look, you don't go looking for grapes at a thorn bush and you don't go looking for figs at thistles. Okay? It's a little funny. It's a little humorous. And he's doing this purposely to make a point. And that point is this. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So let's talk about this idea of bad fruit and good fruit. And I know that you can't hear me, but I'm just going to kind of use my imagination here and ask you the question, what is, I can, excuse me, I know you can hear me, but I can't hear you is what I meant to say. I'm going to ask you this question, what is your favorite fruit? What is your, now there's only one other person in this room with me right now, and that's Jim the cameraman, and he told me that his favorite fruit was mango. Right? Mango. And by the way, I ask this question of lots and lots and lots of people. In fact, I have a whole battery of questions that I just love to ask people. I ask in any situation, a meal, hanging out, uh, on a road trip, I just start asking my long list of questions. Someone has told me that I should write a book with all of my questions. And one of my questions that I love to ask people is, what's your favorite fruit? And so I wish I could hear all of your answers, but I did hear Jim say mango, and I'm going to be honest, mango is probably one of the, if not the, most frequently reported answer uh, when I ask that question. So I'm going to tell you what my favorite fruit is, but I'm going to kind of tell it to you in, in two different ways. The first one I'm going to show you is the fruit that I eat the most, and that is watermelon. I mean, to me, if you have a good watermelon, like, you know, one that's like an eight or a nine or even a 10 out of 10, if it's nice and cold, especially on a hot day and it's cubed like this, I would rather eat that than anything else in the whole world. And I love to eat. I love Indian food. I love Thai food. I love Italian food. I love Mediterranean food. But if I have my choice and I can eat cold, chilled, perfect watermelon with a great texture and sweetness. I'm going to eat that all the time. In fact, you know what's really good on watermelon? If you've never done this before, squeeze a little lime on it is amazing. And even, this might sound weird, putting a little salt on watermelon is actually really, really good. I see Jim nodding his head. Okay, now this is my favorite fruit that I actually eat quite a lot because watermelons are fairly common. But let me show you this fruit. Now, Jim immediately knew what this fruit was, but I'm imagining that many of you, when you look at that, you don't know what that is. Some of you, I'm sure, do. But I've shown this picture or pictures like this to a lot of different people, and I've said, this, for me, is the best tasting fruit I've ever experienced. Now, the reason it's not my favorite fruit is they're very hard to come by. Found, prim found primarily in Southeast Asia, places like Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines. And this fruit is called a mangosteen a mangosteen, and you're probably not going to find one in your local grocery store in the United States. We couldn't even get them very regularly in Australia because they don't ship well. They're very expensive and extremely tasty. Do you like the taste of them? They're amazing, absolutely amazing. Jim says yes. Now, that's my favorite fruit, watermelon. My favorite tasting fruit is mangosteens, but I only get to eat them about once every, maybe twice a decade. But let me ask you this question. What's the worst fruit you've ever eaten? And I think you said apricot. Is that right? Some people, say, some people don't like apricots. All right. Let me show you this here. Let me, I don't, you probably don't know what that is unless you are from the Caribbean and especially Jamaica. Several years ago, my wife and I went to Jamaica and we were going through a fruit market and there was somebody that said, oh, there's a fruit here. It's a really unusual local fruit. You have to try it. And I said, okay, sure, I'm, I'm up for trying anything once, at least once. And I said, what's the name of the fruit? And they said, stinking toe. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Stinking toe. <laughs> the fruit is called stinking toe. And I'm not making this up. When you open it up, it smells like feet. 
bad feet, like gym sock, sweaty, athletic shoe feet. It doesn't smell good. Now, why anybody would want to eat that? Why the first person got the idea? You know what? I'm really hungry. Let me eat something that smells like gym socks. Well, I tried it and uh, it was bad. It was bad. It's hard to tell from this picture, but the actual inside is, is a kind of powdery substance and uh, it, it doesn't smell very good. It smells terrible and it doesn't even taste very good, but it's not even the worst fruit. The worst fruit that I've ever eaten is this bad boy right here. And this is what's called a durian. Now, remarkably, there are lots of people in the world that like this fruit, including the cameraman, Jim, who spent some time in his childhood in Thailand. And uh, there are people that like this fruit. It's amazing. If you've never had it, I can tell you this. The first time I ever had it, it was a Filipino elder from the first church that I ever pastored. His name was Ben, a lovely, wonderful man. And uh, he got me to taste some of this, and I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, David, you must try this. It smells like hell, but it tastes like heaven. <laughs> anyway, I tasted it, and to me, uh, it both smelled like hell and tasted like hell. In fact, look at this headline from the Smithsonian Magazine website. A stinky durian fruit led to the evacuation of an Australian library. It was initially feared that the overwhelming stench stemmed from a gas leak. Now, I have done some travel in Southeast Asia, not a lot, but I've, I've been to several countries there. And I can tell you this, there are literally signs like this on restaurants, public places, hotels, and there are signs that say things like this, you know, don't bring any flammable objects in here and don't bring your pets in here and don't loiter and don't bring your durian. I mean, I don't know if you can see this or not, but literally no durian or strong smelling food uh, because it's... It just doesn't smell good. Even the people that like the taste of it, I think, generally would say it has almost a kind of sewery smell. It, yeah. So Jesus said, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. And so I just wanted to spend a little time talking to you there about some really good fruit, i.e. watermelon and mangosteen, and some not-so-good fruits, stinking toe and durian. Now let's go to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 7, verse 4, and let's see if we can better understand this idea of bearing fruit. What does that mean, to produce a crop or to bear fruit? So Paul writes in Romans 7, Christ lived and died in order that we might bear fruit for God. Bear fruit. So, so this idea of bearing fruit would make a lot of sense in an, with an agricultural people, people that were accustomed to growing things and having orchards and, and planting and harvesting. So in both the Old and the New Testaments, we find this analogy of bearing fruit, right? Here we are in the New Testament, the book of Romans. We were just quoting Jesus in the New Testament, and we started off by looking at Psalm 1, let me read to you again, verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. So this idea, this, this analogy of human beings bearing some kind of fruit, of course, they're not literally mangoes or bananas or avocados poking off of us. So let's see if we can get a better understanding of what it means to bear fruit for God. So now we're going to go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 6, and Paul writes and says this to the church in Colossae, the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings of Jesus is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. Fascinating. Just as it has been doing among you, now watch this, since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Okay, this is very, very important. Paul says that the gospel is bearing fruit. The go what? The gospel is bearing fruit, very much in line with Jesus' parable of the sower, that some fell on the path and some fell in rocky places, but some fell on good soil and bore a crop, bore fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100-fold. Paul here uses the same language. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing, but who is it bearing fruit with and for, and in what sense is it growing? Look at this. He says, since the day you heard it, okay, and truly understood God's grace, God's unmerited favor. Okay, so let's understand this. A key then would be, so when we hear, number one, truly understand, number two, and then receive it, the gospel bears fruit. Okay, so get all three of those. We have to hear the gospel, we have to truly understand the gospel, and then we have to receive the gospel. And when all of those things are in place, Paul says, 
The gospel bears fruit. So back to Matthew, the parable of the sower. Remember Jesus said, still others fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred uh, some uh, 100, some 60, some 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Well, that's what Paul just said back here. Right, right back here. He says, since the day you heard it and understood it. Let's talk more about this idea. Whoever has ears, in that same chapter, Matthew chapter 13, when Jesus gives an explanation of the parable, which he didn't always do, he says, the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who, very same language as Paul, who hears the word and understands it. So let's just remind ourselves, Paul said the gospel bears fruit in those that hear, truly understand, and receive it. Okay? That's the same thing Jesus says here. The good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. I really like, I quoted this in our first session, I really like the way the message, Eugene Peterson's The Message, translates this verse. The seed cast on good earth is the person who hears and and takes in, receives the news. And notice capital N there. The news. What news? The good news. The glad tidings. The gospel. Well, what is the good news? What are the glad tidings? What is the gospel? Friends, it's the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ and the, the salvation that is given to us by grace through faith. Right? When we hear that news, we say, wait a minute, explain it again. So we hear it. Then we say, explain it again, explain it again. Now we understand it, and then we're faced with a choice. Do we want to receive it? Do we want to take in that news? Well, I want you to notice the very important preposition. We quoted this the last time we were together, John chapter 15, where we talked about grafting. Jesus says, I am the vine. Jesus is the vine. He is the root. Notice the very important preposition, in. In, because Jesus is going to use it over and over and over again in John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, right? That's, a, that's absurd that you can cut a branch off set it there on the table or on the shelf and think that it's going to bear fruit? No, it must remain, here's our preposition again, in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For, uh, for apart from me, you can do nothing. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So this idea of in, 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 Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 15, stay in me, stay connected to me. And we've already talked about this idea of grafting, where you take the rootstock and you make a split in it, and then you slide the scion in, right? And the scion eventually will grow and will end up with a situation, there's a, a, a brand new sign that's just been placed in the rootstock, and this is what it can look like after years of growing together. It's almost indistinguishable, right? You, if you didn't know what you were looking at, you wouldn't know that you were looking here at a grafted tree. Jesus says, stay in me, stay connected to me. If you were to take that branch there, that sign that's in the uh, far left picture for you, right picture for me, and just lay it on the ground or lay it on a table or a shelf somewhere, it couldn't bear fruit, but it can certainly bear fruit here because it's in the root. It's in the vine. It's connected, receiving all of the nutrients and the water and the minerals from the soil and through the roots. So believers are grafted into Jesus. We've said this again and again and again. He is our strong and stable root. And, and this is where we encounter one of the most important phrases in the entire New Testament, a phrase that occurs almost 100 times, largely and most often in the writings of Paul. And that's the phrase, in Christ, in Christ. Paul says it over and over and over again. I literally could give you a bombardment, a fire hydrant of texts to show you that Paul was adamant about this idea, this concept, this teaching of the gospel. Remember, we hear it, we truly understand it, and then we receive it. And when we receive it, we are grafted into Christ. 
He's the representative. He's God's representative to man and man's representative to God. And when human beings are grafted into Christ, what's true of Christ becomes true of us because we are in him. We are in him, in Christ. And so I could literally bombard you with dozens and dozens of New Testament passages to this effect, but I'm not going to do that. I'm only, go, I'm only going to give you two, just two. And the first one is Romans chapter 3, verse 24, where Paul says, believers are justified freely, freely without cost, right? You can't earn it. You can't purchase it. You, you, you can't procure it. You receive it freely, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, so let me ask you this question. According to that text, pretend like that's the only text I've even put up on the screen here. According to that text, where is the location of our redemption? Where is the location of our rescue? Where is the location of our salvation? According to that text. Well, Paul tells you that our redemption is located in Christ Jesus. Our redemption, our safety, our rescue is located in Christ, in Christ, not outside of Christ, in Christ. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, a well-known Pauline passage, one of my favorites. Therefore, if anyone is what? In Christ. He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In Christ in Christ over and over and over again. And we've already quoted this verse, but I'll just remind you of it. Paul says, Christ lived and died in order that we, fallen human beings, redeemed, saved, reconciled human beings, might what? Might what? Might bear fruit for God. Now, you might still be sitting there thinking, okay, what do you mean to bear fruit? Like, how do I bear fruit? What does that mean? What does that fruit look like? Is it a mango? Is it an avocado? Is it a cherry? Is it a peach? Is it a plum? Well, I'm so glad you asked because here in another very important Pauline passage, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, we encounter Paul's description of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Now, sometimes you'll hear even preachers misquote this and they'll say the fruits of the Spirit as if it's the plural. There are nine different fruits, like there's apples and bananas and nectarines and pears. No, 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 no. Paul says the fruit singular of the Spirit, but that fruit singular has nine, nine characteristics. And let me just read through those characteristics here from Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, faith, meekness, self-control. So you have three groups of three here. Now, I want to show you something really cool that you might not have known. Look at the second characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit is joy, right? Love, which you might have guessed, and then joy, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. And look at what I've just put down here in note. Note, the origin of the word fruit in the English language, is actually, it actually derives from a word, an old French word. I think it's an old Latin word uh, coming through the French that actually means joy. I think the word is frui, joy or enjoyment, which makes a lot of sense, especially at a time where uh, back then you couldn't just go into a local Whole Foods or a supermarket and buy, you know, some fruit from Chile, you know, grapes from Chile or bananas from Costa Rica or wherever, right? Nowadays, we can just go in and get our fruit. But, but in those days, when, when the fruit came, when, when the seasonal harvest came and, the, and the, the trees were dripping with fruits and laden with fruits, it was a time of great frui. It was a time of great joy, right? And so it's just a really cool little tie together that the actual word that we derive uh, our word, well, the word that creates the word that we call fruit derives originally from a word meaning joy or enjoyment. And if you've ever sat down, as I said earlier, to a nice chilled bowl of cubed watermelon, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, I got all kinds of dopamine and happy. I got happiness coursing through my veins and then into my mouth when I eat that. So I want you to notice here that the nine characteristics are divided into three groups of three, right? Three triads, a triad of triads, if you will. Notice the first, love, joy, peace. The second, patience, gentleness, kindness. And then the third, faith, meekness, and self-control. Now, now watch this. This is absolutely fascinating. 
These three groups of three actually tell us how we are to relate to God, to others, and even to ourselves. Okay, let's start with how we relate to God, and we'll just click back to this slide. We relate to God, we love Him, we have joy in Him, and He gives us His peace. So we relate to God on the basis of love, joy, and peace. But notice those next three, patience, gentleness, and kindness largely describes how we are called to relate to others, right? Isn't that absolutely cool? We want to relate to others with patience, yes, with gentleness, yes, and with kindness, yes. But notice this one, the third, uh, let me go back one here. The third category here, how we relate to ourselves, well, watch this. We want to have faith and we want to be meek. We, want to, we don't want to think of ourselves as more than we are or compare ourselves among ourselves. And we want to practice self-control. So it's absolutely remarkable that even within the context of the fruit of the Spirit, in other words, what your life will look like when you've heard, truly understood, and received the gospel is we will live toward God in a certain way, we will live toward others in a certain way, and we will even live toward ourselves in a certain way. How is it that we will live toward God? With love, joy, and peace. How is it that we will live toward those around us? With patience, gentleness, and kindness. And how will we live to ourselves? With meekness and faith and self-control. Isn't that so cool? How we relate to God, how we relate to others, and how we relate to ourselves in that triad of triads. Now, in case you're tempted to be like, well, that's a hard life, that's a difficult life, that's a glum life, au contraire. Au contraire, mon frere. Remember, the second characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit was joy. God wants you to be maximally happy and joyful. But I'm going to teach you something here that's counterintuitive. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's absolutely true. Like many of the things that Jesus said, when you first hear it, you scratch your head and say, what? Really? Right? Like Jesus said, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Jesus said things like, take away from him that has nothing and give to him that has a lot. Right? This is one of those paradoxical things that Jesus said here. And I want to introduce this idea to you that we are happiest when we are blessing and benefiting others and not living only for ourselves. By the way, this isn't just a religious idea that's found in both the Old and the New Testaments. It's actually been proven over and over again in numerous experiments that people actually prefer, if, if given two options, people prefer in terms of the, the enjoyment and the happiness and the satisfaction that they feel to be a benefit to others than just to live in an isolated or selfish way to themselves. It's absolutely remarkable. So notice this, what Jesus says in another agricultural passage, John chapter 12, a passage that we haven't quoted from up to this point in the series. So Jesus says, most assuredly I say to you, believe me when I tell you this, unless a grain of wheat, or I put here a seed, falls into the ground and dies, boy, you didn't see that coming, did you? Falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much fruit. Okay, whoa, 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 we're gonna have to understand this. So let's go back to that tomato plant that we were talking about earlier. Remember, we planted our tomato plant and then it produced 20 tomatoes. Each of those 20 tomatoes had 10 seeds. So now we have 200 seeds. But let's just imagine that we took that tomato seed and we said, well, you know, I don't wanna risk putting it in the ground and, and what if it doesn't grow or I don't wanna lose it. And so we took our tomato seed and we just set it on a shelf. Okay, and we put it in a little glass jar and we put it on a shelf and we went back a month later. What do we have? We have a tomato seed. If we go back a year later, what do we have? We have a tomato seed. If we go back under the right conditions a decade or even a century later, what do we have? We have a tomato seed. So watch what Jesus is saying. If, however, you take that tomato seed and you put it into the ground, if you've ever seen this, when the seed begins to germinate and it breaks open, it's as if the seed, in the words of Jesus, dies, right? That seed dies and then gives rise to a plant that will produce many, many more seeds. Remember what Jesus said? Some 30, some 60, some 100. And so in this is an important lesson. In order to bear fruit for God, at some level, we have to die. Well, what do we have to die to? Well, we die to ourselves, we die to selfishness, we die to sin. We die to living in selfish isolation from others. We say, that's not the best way to live. It's not going to make me maximally happy, and it certainly isn't gonna make anybody else maximally happy if I'm just living 
to myself, to my own selfish desires and ambitions and goals. And everybody else is just a bit player in the great drama, the great screenplay that is my life. Aren't you all happy you get to feature as a cameo appearance in my life? No, that's not how we're happiest. We're happiest when we are involving ourselves in the lives of others and helping others. I'm going to just talk briefly here about Jim, who I've mentioned several times. He's the camera operator. So he's not only the camera operator, he's a friend of mine. And uh, earlier today, I had a frustrating situation where I'm trying to get a tow hitch installed in my uh, uh, my car, my wife and I's car. We drive a Subaru. And uh, so I went in and they didn't have the part and it's just been a mess. You'd think it would be a fairly easy thing to order a tow hitch and install it on the back of a Subaru Forester. Oh, no, 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 no. Complicated, difficult. And so anyway, we were supposed to have it done today. It didn't work out. So I came in here and I was a little frustrated. And I was telling Jim, Jim, ah, oh, man, I'm so frustrated. They want to, you know, want me to wait another week. And then, and he said, well, I'll help you do it. Well, I, I've, I've installed those before. I can do that. And it, I was just like, I just all of a sudden had this relief, right? Because another person took an interest in something that was, and it's a small thing, but still it made a difference to me, right? It was like, no, I, I've done that before. Hey, I think we can, hey, let me Google that. We do a little bit of research and we find out what the part costs and it's going to, looks like it's going to save me money. And, and somebody thinking about me, thumbs up to you, Jim, uh, somebody thinking about it, it's good for them. It's good for me. It's absolutely amazing. And this is the point that Jesus is making here. When we live selfishly and in an isolated way only to ourselves, this does not produce maximal happiness. It actually produces discouragement, depression, alienation. But if we take ourselves and we plant ourselves, as it were, into the ground, and in some sense we die, we can actually bear fruit for God. What kind of fruit? Well, the fruit we were just talking about a moment ago. The way that we live toward God, the way that we live toward those around us, and even the way that we live toward ourselves. The fruit of the Spirit that Paul describes in Galatians chapter 5. And by the way, a, a connected to or a corollary of living that way is that people are then drawn to that way of living and they too will hear the gospel, receive the, hear the gospel, truly understand it, receive it, and then they will bear fruit. And then those that hear it from them will bear fruit. And then those that hear it from them will bear fruit. Just like the tomato plant that goes in, you have the 20 tomatoes, each with the 10 seeds, and all of a sudden, before you know it, we've got a field of tomato plants. Right? Absolutely incredible. When it dies, it produces much fruit. And this is the paradox. What Jesus is saying here is that we get our life by giving it away, and we lose our life by keeping it. Wow. What a paradox. What a radical idea. You might remember the last time we were together, we quoted from Dr. Seuss. Today you are you. That is truer than true, and no one alive. There's no one alive who is youer than you. And remember one of the things that we mentioned. In fact, let me just share two of the things that we mentioned on this idea that you are unique and you are wonderful. The only one of you. Both of them are outward facing. They're ministry focused. Look at this. Because you are one of a kind, you are uniquely equipped to contribute to the lives of others and to the world around you in a way that no one else can. Remember this one. Because you are irreplaceable, you can love and be loved in a way that no one else ever has been or ever will be. Absolutely amazing. We bear fruit for God by being in Christ, who is the root and who is the vine. Bearing fruit for God means living toward him in a certain way, living toward others in a certain way, a way as described in scripture, a way as described and exemplified in the life of Jesus, and even in the way that we live toward ourselves. Absolutely incredible. And so let's just sort of wrap this all up and remind ourselves of where we began in Matthew chapter 13 with the parable of the sower. And Jesus said that a farmer went out to sow his seed and he indiscriminately scattered his seed here, there, and everywhere. And some fell on the path and some fell on rocky places and some fell among thorns, but some fell on good soil. And when it fell on good soil, it brought forth fruit. Fruit, a life of fruitfulness, a life of joy, a life of peace, a life of love, a life of service and ministry to others. In fact, let me just say this. Think about Jesus himself as the seed, right? Jesus, as it were, was planted in the ground. Jesus went into the tomb. His body was covered. It was like the, the seed that was placed in the soil and covered. But what ended up happening? Jesus died 
But then in dying, he what? He came up from the ground. He came up and sprouted and produced the early church. And then the early church produced, and it spread throughout the larger Mediterranean world. And then eventually throughout the entire world. And literally, literally hundreds of millions of people, millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of people have come to be followers of Jesus. Why? Because he died and he rose from the grave and he bore fruit. In the same way, we can die. And when we're, we're, when we're raised in baptism, when we're raised in faith, when we're raised in belief, God begins to bear fruit in our lives. In the way that we live, in the way that we talk, in the way that we love, in the way that we treat others. And then again, others looking on see that and they find it attractive and they're drawn to it. So we want to be good soil. An open and soft heart toward Jesus and toward his words is the good soil that Jesus spoke of. So in closing this series, Rooted and Built Up, I want to ask you a question. Two questions, actually. The first one is, what kind of soil do you want to be? What kind of soil, what kind of landing place do you want to be for the gospel seed? Right? Remember, we need to hear it, understand it, and then receive it. But it's not enough just to ask you what kind of soil you want to be. How about this question? What kind of soil do you choose to be? Because it is a choice that you will make. Remember, one of the things that we talked about in our first session is things that you have control over. One of them is your choices. You can choose to receive Jesus, to accept Jesus, to live the maximally happy and joyful life that he created you and designed you to live so we're getting ready to wrap up here, wrap up not just uh, this presentation, but our whole series. And let's remind ourselves of Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, the very passage from which our series has uh, derived its name, rooted and built up, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, as Master, as King. Continue to live your lives where? In Him rooted right down to the soil, to the roots, all the way up into the strong tree, out into the branches, and then even into the fruit. Continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. That is to say, love. This sounds very much like a New Testament version of our passage right here. In fact, I've got it here. I think I've got it. Our passage, there it is, from Psalm 1. A Christian is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. God's desire for you and God's desire for me is to be like that tree, right? From the soil to the roots to the tree. We've talked about all those things. We've talked about environment and the importance of absorbing the right things and being anchored to the right thing. We talked about individuality and identity. And then today we've talked about the purpose of the tree is to bear fruit, to bear fruit, fruit to God, fruit to those around us so that God is glorified. Remember Jesus said those exact words, herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. Jesus invites us to be like the tree that's planted by living waters that bears its fruit in its season. Jesus invites us to be rooted and built up. I know that's what I want to be, and I hope you've enjoyed this series. And it's a simple series. And I just hope that it, at every stage of your own development, your own journey with Jesus, that you'll just take stock, take, take evaluation of the soil, the condition of your soil, the strength and absorption of your roots, that you're clinging to Christ and that your identity and your individuality is not being found and being compared to others. And that finally, take stock and evaluation. Am I bearing fruit in my family, in my school, in my community, in my neighborhood, and in my situation? God bless you all. It's been great to be with you, Storyline. I want to just make a final invitation and appeal. Who wants to say with me? You can just raise your hand if you're in a group or just raise your hand by your own computer or your smartphone and say, you know what? I want to be good soil. I want to hear the gospel. I want to receive it, truly understand it, and then receive it into my heart. If you want to do that, just raise your hand to heaven right now. That's what I'm doing. And let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, this has been a great series. Rooted and built up is what Paul said to the church there in Colossae. And Father, we want that to be true of us. We want to be fruit-bearing, God-glorifying disciples of Jesus. 
And Father, we know that's not possible in our own strength, with our own capacity or skills. Father, we need to be cleansed. We need to be forgiven. We need the grace of Jesus to wash over us. Father, we need to be in Christ. So teach us how to be in Christ, to remain there, to be the new creatures that Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And Father, the prayer of my heart for those that are listening in is that they would decide right here, right now, I want to be good soil. I want to hear and I want to understand, truly understand, and then I want to receive, to take in the seed, to take in the news. And Father, we know that if we do that, you then will do that miraculous work that you do in both the, the plant world and in the tree world, and you do it in human beings. You enable them to be strong and sturdy and healthy and to bear fruit. Father, do that in us and through us, and we will give you all the praise and all the glory because we pray in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.